Um, I'm going to get into trouble, but I love learning, but I hate education. Okay? The six years that I spent in a school in Delhi whose name I shall not recount here were the worst years of my life. And I think this school is not like that, but I think generally education is the worst thing that happened to learning. And I think the reason is because it's an institution that hasn't changed for a thousand years. So just imagine a farmer from Cambridge or Oxford coming into 21st century Oxford. He looks for a blacksmith, he's not going to find the blacksmith. He looks for the carpenter, he's not going to find the carpenter. But if he goes to the university, he's going to find the lectures and the professors pretty much the same as he saw a thousand years ago, if at all he was allowed then, and if at all he's allowed now. So this is the problem, right? That we have an institution that hasn't changed in a thousand years, and the winds of change are blowing in, but we don't know what it's going to look like. But whatever it is, I think it's going to be much better. And what is the underlying most important factor for making this change happen. And that's the book. Right? The book, in my opinion, and I'm a biased participant because I've loved books since the time I was maybe four and I got my hands on my first Amar Chitra Katha. I've, you know, fiction, nonfiction, comics, anything you name it, if it's there, I would want to read it. And now that ebooks are here, we have a whole new technology for pushing books through, for making them, for writing them, for communicating them. And frankly, in my opinion, it's the book in its new form that's going to revolutionize education and learning. So what is the book after all? Right? What should the book be? And incidentally, every revolution in knowledge has been accompanied by a revolution in how we transmit information through books. So what is a book? Well, let's start with William Blake's challenge. Right? So this is from his poem, Auguries of Innocence. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. This is what a book should be doing. Right? It should be allowing you to access the secrets, the mysteries of the universe, to be able to imagine, to be able to create, to be able to connect with others, all of these are being mediated by books. And books have always done this. How has humanity responded to this challenge of William Blake? So what I'm going to tell you is my false history of books. So think about it as science fiction. It's not really how books transform. But I think it's close enough, and it'll give you an idea of how books should be used, if not have been used. So how has humanity responded to William Blake's challenge? Well, first is the biblical answer, right, from Job. In the beginning was the word. So the idea was to capture everything in one line or in one book, which had the truths of nature, of God, everything in one place forever. Now that was great because you could carry it around, you could tell other people, you could talk to other people, you could share the same ideas, and it was all in one place. Great. But as it so turned out, that one place was not really enough to answer the questions of nature in any kind of detail. And by the 15th century in Europe, there were plenty of people who thought that we need a different kind of book. Incidentally, that was when printing, mass printing was discovered, so you could publish books in much larger numbers than you could before. And that man, Rene Descartes, was one of the first people who figured out a new kind of book. Now, Rene Descartes was a Frenchman who flew, you know, who was in trouble, so he fled to Holland, and Holland was very cold in the winter. So what he would do is he would hide inside um, 
the furnace, not when it was lit, but he was hide inside the furnace and think, right? And that's where he came up with, I think, therefore I am. Because you're stuck inside a furnace, it was because the rest of the house was freezing and he had all these thoughts. And because he was trapped in that furnace, he had nothing else to do but to think. And that was the only thing that could convince him that he existed. So I think, therefore I am. And the, Socra and the Cartesian notion of the book was very, very influential. Right? Because what does it allow you to do? You start with the universe as a whole. You bring that into the school. In the school, you have a classroom. In the classroom, you have a book. And this book is therefore the distillation of the universe into one little thing. Right? Ideally, there should be exactly one equation. So if you're a physicist or you are a mathematician, you want to write one equation that solves the problem of the universe. That's the Cartesian book, right? That in, again, back to the Bible, really. One line answer to the question, what's the nature of the universe? There was a famous answer to that question. It was called 42, for those of you who know that. Right? So that's what the book does in the Cartesian world. So it culminates in great books like Newton's Principia, in Darwin's Origin of Species, and other well-known texts. And what these kinds of books have helped us do is to develop a long argument, not just in the book itself, but with other books, with other people who write books, who trade books back and forth. And we can argue with each other and get better and better knowledge. But is that good enough? Is it enough to just have books that culminate in one long argument? And my point is that that idea is great for a time when memory was very expensive. So remember, if you have one equation for the whole universe, you don't need any memory. You just remember that one equation and you have solved the whole universe. Right? But if memory is free, as Anil pointed out, it's not clear that we should be writing books which are trying to reduce the whole world to just one bit. Because Compression is great in books of this kind, but decompression, to embed the books back into the world is very, very hard. And as we are finding out with global warming and other sort of planetary level challenges, is that it's the decompression problem that's the harder problem than the compression problem. So here's an alternate idea of the book. Some of you might recognize that that's a scene from the death of Socrates. Right, the famous Greek philosopher, who never wrote a word. The, everything that we know about Socrates is what other people have written about him. His idea of thinking was to go out and chat with his friends. So he was someone, again, who never had a job. Right? He would go out and annoy people, ask them questions, and he got killed for that. But that's how he wrote books. Right? His idea of a book was something that you write with other people in public, openly. Okay, So the Socratic book should be public, dynamic, open, democratic, open to doubt. Very important. You don't want one final answer. Because again, memory is free. You can always sh change your answer. If memory was very expensive, you don't want to be wrong. But if memory is free, being wrong is fine. So this is the very famous debate that happens between Gandhi and Tagore. Right? Gandhi says to Tagore that he wants to open the doors of his house to all the cultures of the world, but he doesn't want to be blown out of his feet. Now, why is he saying that? Because he's saying that somehow there is a density to knowledge that is very, very important, but that knowledge has to be kept alive through a tradition of inquiry that passes down from generation to generation. And again, this is the challenge of the new book. How can it be open, dynamic, and yet be grounded in some tradition of inquiry? Whether that is science, whether that is philosophy, whether that's the arts, there should be some building upon the shoulders of the previous giants. And that's our new challenge. Right? How 
can we build these new books that will be open, dynamic, and yet grounded? Okay. So imagine your own handheld Socrates. Right? Socrates was very famous in saying that he is the midwife of wisdom. So it's that he didn't know. It was not his job. He was barren because his mother actually was, again, a midwife. Right? Midwives are often women who are post-menopausal. They are actually not capable of having children, but they help others have children. So your handheld Socrates, maybe it'll just be a mobile phone. Maybe it'll be some kind of tablet. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but a book should be your handheld Socrates. Right? It should be the midwife of your wisdom. You should be able to zoom in and out of the universe. Right? You should be able to start from that book, go into the classroom, go into the school, and then go out into the universe. This zooming out, this decompression, is what books have to solve now. It's no longer about compressing the world into a book, but opening out into the world using the book. Right? So the books should be like your eye. We heard Dr. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson talk about how we all have bodies. So instead of imagining books as a brain in a vat, which is not connected to the rest of the world, it's just this abstract thing, like marks on a piece of paper, imagine that books were things which had eyes and ears and could smell. So it's like your personal book robot. Think about it that way. Right? If you've seen or read Philip Pullman's um, His Dark Materials trilogy, in the first, there's a daemon, right? which is sort of your external soul. So a book should be your external soul. Right? It should be the repository of the wisdom, not just of your own, but of the rest of the human race. And you should be able to incorporate all that wisdom and deliver it to you in a format that you can understand. So this kind of reconfigurable book, something that will change dynamically as you age, so you could grow with the book. I, I don't know what it's going to really look like, but the fact is that the technology is almost here. You can imagine you buy a maths book or you buy a history book, and you buy it in first grade, and it's the same book throughout. It's like your favorite doll, or your favorite blanket, or your favorite cup. You keep using it throughout the years, and it slowly changes as you grow too. And new information comes in that scientists create or artists create, and that is incorporated seamlessly into the book. So this imperceptibly changing but alive repository of knowledge is what we should be creating. And I think, again, the technology is here. The problem is no longer of technology. The problem is of imagination. Because the fact of the matter is that almost all of education is still grounded in the old idea of the book. Right? You have your syllabus, your first standard syllabus, your second standard syllabus, and your third standard syllabus. So why should we have these kind of discrete chunks? Why one year for each subject? Why not a book that just changes from morning to evening? The world is changing that fast, so why shouldn't our books change? So just imagine a textbook that is caters to you, your needs. So it turns out that it evaluates you, and it finds that you are better at math than at dancing, or you're better at dancing than at math, and it automatically channels you in those directions. So a smart book. A book that actually learns with you rather than learns because of you, right? That's a new kind of book that we should be creating. So what I'm trying to get here is there's a lot of new technology around artificial intelligence, around the internet, around information flows. But ultimately, at least as far as we human beings are concerned, Unless it enriches our lives, it's not that interesting. I mean, if robots were so smart that they could rule over us, great. But that's not the human world anymore. In fact, that's not the living world anymore. But if 
you can have smart adjuncts to our lives, things that would help us become wise, and that would actually aggregate the collective wisdom of humanity into an easily held format. And when I say held, I mean literally in that sense. Right? Ultimately, you want to be able to hold it in your hands. And so if you can hold the collective wisdom of humanity in your hands, and it would then interact with you in ways that are easier for you to understand. So if you're a visual learner, it should have more visual material in it. If you are a, an analytic learner, it should have more symbols in it. If you are a linguistic learner, it should have words in it. Everything, the entire experience of the book should evolve with you. And that kind of self-evolving book, to me, is the future of learning. So with that, I'll say, last couple of words, right? So the technology is almost there. And this technology is not just going to be for rich people. This technology should be for everybody. And so there must be a public investment in it. And when that happens, I think that educators, scientists, technologists, everybody should get together and make sure that we have as much access to this sort of new wisdom as possible. Thank you.